So what else are we getting? The second map that we see, this is again, after the model is calibrated, it's then just taking those projection layers and it's saying, well, for this model, for every grid cell in the landscape, under these new conditions, what's the prediction? So this is the prediction for the 2050s. Okay, remember we put in that layer of set of folders that was the projection, and um, this is just building the model for the baseline data, for the present day data, and then projecting it onto these layers. And you'll see the patterns change. This is where, you know, um, I'm not gonna try and analyze it now, but this is where you expect to see things like polar shifts in the, in the potential suitable habitat. And, and Enrique's gonna talk about some climate change applications tomorrow, but that's one of the clear signals that you would expect to see is the climate's warming, um, the, the, the suitable habitat, the suitable climate space, if you like, the bicline globe is gonna to shift towards the pole or it's gonna shift upstream. Those patterns can be a lot more complicated than that, but that's the kind of um, pattern that you would expect to see. And the model is then just plotting on top these occurrence records, but those are exactly the same occurrence records as, as we use to calibrate the model. There's no projection Okay, and again, that's just the, the visualizing the ASCII grid that's in your results output. So that is just a picture of this file, and that's a, that's a, you know that's one of your key outputs that you might want to start having a look at. interesting this afternoon as you start to get out some of these kind of results is let's start having a look at these predictions, particularly when you start getting into your own study species in your own region, do they make sense, you see the kinds of patterns that you'd expect to see. So again, I'm not going to try and talk through everything um, in this output file, I'm going to point you towards a few key things. Um, this is a, a key one to look at, and um, this is the, what Tan referred to um, as, as the um, uh, NESS surface. What, and, and, and this is well written up and documented and, and, and debated um, in, in the literature. I'm not going to try and um, explain the details of how this surface is presented, from, but from a very practical sense, this is telling you that, in effect, you have less confidence in areas that are shown in coming out as red and you have more confidence in areas that are shown in blue. This is when you're projecting, so this is under the future scenario. So, it is saying that in those areas shown in red, the model is in effect extrapolating more, it has less certainty in its predictions, it's making a bigger guess, if you like, into those regions because they are less similar to what the model has seen during, during calibration. Okay. So this is a really nice way of being able to look at your results and say, well, you know, in this part of the, in this part of the continent, um, I can have higher confidence in my predictions because I'm doing less extrapolation. I'm, I'm, I'm asking the model to, to, to estimate outside its comfort range, if you like, less than in some of these other regions, okay? So, um, again, just pointing you towards, there's, there's literature on this, but in a practical sense, this is, these are outputs that you're going to find really potentially useful for trying to get your head around um, in, in interpreting the output. Now, unfortunately, there's no golden rule as to um, you know what's what's too red, if you like, you know, which are the areas that you really should not be interpreting. There's, 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 it becomes a grey area, but this is informative for helping you to think through um, your your model prediction. So, if, for example, you've got one of these surfaces that was highly red all over your study region. That would be a real warning sign that hang on, and maybe asking the model to do something that is is, is unreasonable um, and, 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 and isn't isn't going to be very informative. Uh, the next map can be quite interesting because that's actually going to tell you which is the most important variable in terms of, uh, or which is the variable that's driving that uncertainty. So which is the variable that has the most uncertainty associated? So we saw on the previous picture that these areas in, 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 in northern um, Africa are uh, the more uncertain ones. So we're getting uh, predictions here and it's saying that in these particular areas, these are the particular variables 
that are causing that uncertainty. So they're the most important variables for driving that uncertainty. In effect, these are the variables that you are making a prediction for that's more outside the comfort range of the model. It's further beyond what the model was um, calibrated for. So if, if the result coming out here was, um, you know, your, your variable is the absolute maximum temperature during the year, and that came out as, as, as highly important, then this would be telling you that that the um, that you are asking your model to predict into very high temperatures that are way outside what the model was, was calibrated for. So it's, it's some very useful um, information. Finishing off these response curves, remember you don't have to ask for response curves, but it doesn't take that long and it can be interesting to do. We've talked a lot about trying to characterize how based on a single environmental dimension, how your, your, your prediction is responding, or how your species is responding to that variable. And this is uh, a way that, that, that you can visualize at least how max n, how the model is interpreting the data. So what you're seeing is for each of the input variables, you're seeing a graph that shows you kind of the value of that variable, and a measure of suitability, or a measure of, of um, uh, uh, how how suitable that particular value is for the species. And it, you can read it's a bit more complicated. It comes back to to, to, to how the model uses uh, how it trains using this idea of, of, of gain. But essentially, essentially, I think you can interpret it that um, these are you know low to high being a variable, and then how suitable uh, the model is 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 finding that variable for for this particular species. So this species is. Is had for, for bio 13, which is one of the precipitation variables, has uh, low values, it has low suitability, but the, the species likes it when that value gets higher, when that particular variable gets higher. So some of these are flatlined, bio 15. This is a case where the model is basically saying, well, I have um, uh, not finding any useful information from this. I'm basically just keeping that, you know, if you keep that value constant or you change it, and you the, the, the model is going to be the same um, prediction. So that would be a useful way of saying, you know, bio 15 really isn't, isn't contributing anything to, to this model. So you can look, and sometimes you see that these, these, these variable, these, these response curves would be really jagged, and that would be a case of overfitting. Remember I showed you a, a, a conceptual diagram yesterday that had a kind of a nicely bell-shaped response curve, and then a red line fit on top of it that was really jaggy. Uh, then that, that could come through at, at this stage and, and you'd be able to you'd be able to visualize it. Now in practice how the model does this is it does it in two ways. Firstly, it keeps all of the other values constant, sorry, all of the other variables constant, and it then just varies over this range, this one particular variable, and it does that for all the variables. Okay? And then it sees how the performance of the model changes when you change just that variable. So this first set of blocks is saying, within the model that you've built, how is, how is this um, species responding to this particular variable? Okay, in the context of the other variables. Now a key thing and a key caveat with interpreting these kinds of graphs is that if you have very highly correlated variables, then the way the model works, it might see one variable pull out a ton of information from it give you a nice neat response curve like this, and then find another variable that is very, very highly correlated, but it's, the model is going to say, well, I've kind of already found that information, this, model, this variable isn't telling me anything new. So it's going to say, I'm not getting any useful information from that model. Okay? If you have very highly correlated variables, it might be that Bio 15 actually has some very useful information in it, but the model is using that information in Bio 16, which is very highly correlated with, so it's not taking much information from Bio 15. So if you have a case where you have very highly correlated variables, then you have to be careful when interpreting these, these, these figures. But again, they are useful information to help you interpret the, the information that you're getting out from there. There's a second set of response curves that you will automatically be given. These are very, very similar, and you hope that they, they match the other ones fairly closely, or, or in certain circumstances they, they, they might or might not, it largely depends on correlations between 
variables. But this is saying, I'm just going to, this, this is where the model just builds a model based on that single variable and then varies that variable and, tell, that variable and tells you how, based on that very single variable model, how the model um, responds to that, to that variable. So this, this is kind of not taking into account the correlations with the other variables. This is just building a model for this single variable. So again, this can be very useful for um, uh, you know, looking at how your, how your model just responds to that single variable, or how your species might just respond to that single variable. And you'll see, um, I just noticed that by 15 and, and 16, remember 15 was, was, was a was flat line, there was no, no response in the curves above. Well, in this case, if you build a model with that variable on its own, then you do get a response. So that variable, I would say, is probably very highly correlated with one of the other variables, and, and that makes sense. So no hard and fast rules here about exactly you know, what the bottom line is for how to interpret these, other than here's a bunch of really useful information that can be very useful for, for interpreting your, your model outputs and understanding what results you're getting. And it's going to give you some very clear flags as well. As I say, if, if these, these curves could show you that your models are very highly overfit, if they're extremely, um, extremely complex. And again, this is a very powerful tool, it's a very powerful algorithm that can enable you to fit very complex response curves. And that's where you might think, oh, hang on, I need to go back to, for example, my regularization multiplier, remember that parameter I said to play with? That's going to affect, remember I said, it's going to affect how closely or not you fit to your occurrence records, but in effect, that's going to affect how jagged these response curves are. So this is, you know, something we need to look out for. You might be going back and say, well, clearly I've overfit to my training data. Um, my valuation statistics aren't that great, so I'm going to change my regularization multiplier to get more smooth response curves. Um, and you see, you see the change of thought about this. Your calibration process to try and build better and better models. Um, I think that for now, that's all taking plenty of time. They're, they're the key things that I wanted to, to mention to you. They're, as I say, it's in the tutorial and we can, we can talk through it over the practical time this afternoon. There are a bunch of other things to play with and, 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 and you know, there's, a, there's, there's, there's an awful lot of power beyond what we've shown you in, in, in this brief time, but I think that what we've given you are, are the, the key things, load the information, change some parameters, um, project to another um, scenario, another, another landscape or another climate scenario, and then see your model outputs for that scenario for the, for the, for the present day, and get out your evaluation statistics. Those are the key things that we wanted to get across. So you should all know, you know, you've, you've, you've at least been exposed to, to, to those, key, um, those key things. But I would encourage you, you know, if you're going to work with this over the next, next few months and years, really go back and go through some of the tutorials that Stephen's put out, and read the papers that help you understand the math and the theory behind this to, to get a better understanding.